so i'll be using in some of the complex orbital tumor and many of you are already oculoplasty surgeon but let me start with very basic so when we talk about the orbital fracture we know that basically there is a very uh, i mean simple classification which can be either a blow in fracture or a blow out fracture so these are the simple fractures we need to manage which can be managed well without the navigation again there is something called a pure fracture and the impure fracture so what is pure fracture any resident out here like if the orbital rim is intact but the walls are fractured this is a pure fracture and the impure fracture is something what you see here when the orbital walls are being fractured when the rim is being fractured we call it an impure fracture so these types of fractures are more challenging and slowly as we go more deeper into fracture repair we see more challenging fracture which can be in the form of pyramidal fracture like this which we call as z fracture or you can have the the leaf force fracture especially the fracture 2 and 3 comes to us and these are really challenging cases because you can see multiple bones are being affected or you can have more challenging which we call the anoe fracture where there is fracture of the nose fracture of the orbit fracture of the ethmoid and when you go further deep you can see more complicated fracture which can be in the form of the fracture of the orbital apex basically optic canal fracture and sometimes more complicated like when you see the whole globe being subluxated as you can see here the globe has gone to the cranial cavity or sometimes you can see here the globe being subluxated either into the maxilla or into the ethmoid sinus so these are some real challenging situation like most of the fractures luckily we get them in early stage it can be uh, a simple pure or impure fracture but when they come to you to an ophthalmologist with so much of hope we should be able to manage most most of the situation so mirroring is what Dr. Vatsalya has already mentioned. It really helps in cases of your different types of uh, uh, fractures and we come to know with the end point of surgery, we can measure the defect. So we have been using this navigation extensively for the construction of some complicated fracture, especially when you have those uh, impure fracture, which I have already shown, where the horizontal and the vertical buttresses. So you know the whole uh, the face is being held into position by this bone and we call it as a buttresses so when there are involvement of the buttresses and all the impure fracture those are the situation where you need to use a navigation for a very proper and accurate correction this is something what we what is mirroring she has been mentioning mirroring what we do we mirror the normal over the abnormal then we measure and this is no by and, and this is how you can measure how much amount of inophthalmos or the expansion of the orbit so once you measure the expansion of the orbit then you will be knowing that how much thickness of the implant to be given every surgeon till today there is no validated nomogram showing that how much amount of orbital expansion requires how much amount of thickness of the orbit but i feel for every six millimeter of orbital expansion you need at least a one millimeter thickness of the orbit so first as i have already mentioned you need to manage the buttresses once you manage the buttresses you need to manage the walls of the orbit so the buttresses can be managed very well with the titanium screws and this is for the residents these are the infraorbital nerves that white linear structure that you have seen and this is a very nice implant which is known as the mtm or mtb that is a med pore titanium med pore so these are the implants which are very good in those cases where you have too much of inophthalmos like if you have an inferior wall supposing you give an implant of two millimeter and again you have a medial wall fracture and you can design it like a patient specific implant under the two millimeter that means you are collecting four millimeter of inophthalmos so these are very useful and now you see the end point of the surgery my stylet doesn't go down that means i have placed my implant in the correct position i have done the appropriate correction which i have already designed up in my system and you get the different types of correction as you can see here a different type of fracture that can be managed and sometimes this is an implant let me show you this is the implant that you can see here it has been placed so accurately and these are the screws the post-operative screws that has been used for placement of the implant sometimes you see very challenging situation like this and this uh, really gives in a very good way of managing so this video i have been showing you this is a impure fracture where you see a fracture of the orbital wall the fracture of the orbital rim and he has really come to us like this is sad thing because these patients when they have a trauma they first go to a neurosurgical unit then they will have a maxillofacial and they come to us so by the time they come to us it's already scarred 
because I have seen that many of my maxillofacial friends, what they do, they only manage the buttresses. That means the horizontal rim. They only manage the rim. But it's very difficult for them to go transconjunctively and manage the inophthalmus. But what this patient want, ultimately they want the correction of the inophthalmus. They want the correction of the they want the cosmetic correction. So this, pa this patient who had a road traffic accident and he had a bad fracture like this. So in his case, we had to use both a navigation, also a 3D printing. So what is this 3D printing? I feel this, is, this really helps you plan the operation. This is very important. You need to plan the surgery where you have a two-dimensional structure, I mean CT in the DICOM format. And then you convert this into a 3D image. And the most important that you should know how to read it. You should know how to read a CT scan. And then once you have the two dimensional DICOM being converted into 3D, then you have the 3D modeling and ultimately it is being transported into the STL format. So this is how the 3D comes to us. And once it comes to us, can you see with such a bad fracture, then at least you can plan. So in a patient like this, what do, will I plan? I'll plan to manage the zygoma. I'll plan to manage this. And if they, there is an NOE fracture, which is not seen here, but this, he had an NOE fracture, I'll plan to manage the NOE fracture. So at least before operation and sometimes what I do, and this is a um, mirroring I'm doing, the blue is the normal and the pink is the expanded. See how much it has expanded. So before the operation, now you know what size of implant you need to give. You can plan it. And also you can recheck with the mirroring by the navigation system so that you give a good correction. Because these cases are very difficult because they come in such a scarred situation to you. To correct the inophthalmus or to do a fracture surgery at the early stage, it is much easier than when it comes to you at least six months following the post trauma. The beauty here, see, when there is a fracture, it when the whole socket expands, right? And you can see it has become more a rectangular. And following the repair, what you see, it has become more of an oval. And these are the buttresses that were treated. And you can see beautiful titanium plate that are being placed into position. So you have rechanged the rectangular structure into more of an oval normal pyramid. So this is a surgery in brief. I'll just go fast, fast. You can see this is how this is the same patient where you, and the, in the same scar line I'm being drawing it. And then I'm trying to take out the structures. <coughs> and here I'm putting a double layer of a med pore sheet. <coughs> and as you see here, on the table we corrected and then the buttresses are corrected. He, he had a medial cantal dystopia. And the cantal dystopia has been also corrected. That is a very big chapter. We'll not discuss now, but there are different ways of correcting the cantal dystopia. And this is how you see the correction of the inophthalmus. This is <coughs> how the patient looks with the correction of the inophthalmus. This is another lady that you can see having a bad fracture. And this is before the operation we had planned. This is a 3D printing we had done. And we had seen there was a lateral wall fracture. There was an inferior wall fracture. And this is during the procedure. Now we have again measured it. And now we know how much amount of thickness to be placed. And also this is showing the end point of the surgery. As Dr. Vatsala was already mentioning, one of the advantage of this navigation system that is that you know the end point of the surgery. So this is what you see, the post-operative giving a very, almost it looks like the other eye. And you can give in a very late situation only, you, only the scars that you can see here. In a very late situation, you can give this type of correction when you can plan up the surgery. So planning is something very important. There's under the patient having a bad NOE fracture. Just skip the surgery. And you can see the post-operative correction at, at the end of the one month. How beautifully the whole of the dystopia, everything got correct, corrected. And this is the implant, can you see, in the inferior wall and also in the medial wall. <coughs> These are again few other patients that has been used where we have used a navigation system and we have planned it. And many a case we have to do a combination of both the 3D. This is very simple video. I'm going fast. I just want to show you because I can see many other residents out here. There's another implant that you can use it. This is a titanium implant. These titanium implants are real good because these are very inert. And even uh, if you have a titanium implant, you can easily advise MRI. There's no harm to it because uh, many of them uh, do not get affected during the MRI process.
This is something very sad. This child uh, who was in the peak of his career and he had this fracture and then there was gross enough tumors. You can see the whole of the zygoma has come out and hold all the inferior flow fracture. Yeah, and also we have done a 3D printing and then with all this navigation, with all the 3D printing, this is a correction that you could do. So this is something very challenging, like this type of young gentleman when they want, and I think he will need more amount of some fillers or something we need to do to go for the further correction. But I feel the anophthalmus has been quite corrected well, so some amount of other lead surgery will know. So another uh, important indication of navigation, which I always feel anyone doing a uh, decompression of the optic canal, you must use the navigation because there's a very important structure. You can stay medial and superior medial, but if you go inferior lateral, there's every chance of injuring the internal carotid artery. So if, if you don't have this system, it is really, I advise you not to go for the optic canal decompression. Rest of many of the surgeries we can do with the, without the navigation system, but this is something, especially when you need to reach the orbital apex. But interestingly, when this patient they comes to us with a traumatic optic neuropathy, following a road traffic accident, and they are in so much productive age, they'll be hardly between 20 to 30 years. And this, at this productive age, they come to you with a total loss of vision, and you have got nothing to do. Because till today, there are controversy in the management of traumatic optic neuropathy, and there are no clear guidelines what to do for a traumatic optic neuropathy. So there was a very interesting study, the optic nerve trauma study um, has come out. And we all know that in this study, they have done numerous uh, evaluation whether we should give steroids to them or we should only go for the surgical decompression. So and then in this study, they have found that whatever you do, it may not help. So what is the conclusion I'll be telling you? So they have concluded even whether you do surgery, whether you give high dose of steroid or you just observe. There is no clear guidelines. There is, you can take any of the three decision. They could not prove that this is the best treatment. And then a decade later came the NESIS study. The NESIS has shown that if you give a very high bolus dose of steroid, it really helps you. But then in contradiction to you came the CRASH study. The CRASH says that if you give very high dose of steroid, there's every chance of affecting the systemic condition because the uh, dose is very high. It can also lead to the death of the patient. So the, the, um, the International Optic Nerve Trauma Study concluded that neither steroids nor surgery should be considered the standard of care for patients with traumatic optic neuropathy. And what they have mentioned that you can tell the patient that you can do something and hope that the vision will improve or you can also not do anything and also we to hope that the vision will improve. So the conclusion is either you do something, you do, don't do something, you always need to keep a hope that the vision will improve someday. I have seen ENT surgeons like PGI Chandigarh, they have a very nice team, Dr. Vig and also my one of my ex-fellow Dr. Aditi, she also worked there. They used to do the navigation guidance decomposition with the endoscope and through the nasal approach. And the neurosurgeons, what they do, they usually do a transcranial approach and also, but both the approaches, whether it's an orbital approach, everyone has got their own pros and cons, especially in the neurosurgical approach is a too massive surgery. And when you do a nasal approach, you're opening the whole optic canal right up to the nose. Any infection from here goes to the optic canal, that means it goes to the meninges. Chance of meningitis is there. And also when you go to the nasal uh, approach, the carotid optic recess is there. The chance of injuring or touching the optical carotid recess is much higher. So what we do, we do something, this is really simple approach of doing. What you do, uh, you do a very minimally invasive procedure where you give an incision in the medial caruncle and through that you can directly approach the navigation. Uh, you can approach the optic canal. I'm just going fast here, like I'll just show you the, this, the registration that has been done. This is a surgery. See, you are giving a small incision. It's a very, very minimally invasive. Just go 24 mil. You know the rule of 24, 12, 6, right? 24 you go, this is the anti-atomoidal blood vessel. Just cauterize it. Then you go further down, another 12 millimeter, you'll get the posterior atomoidal blood vessel. Can you see? But here we do not cauterize here because 6 millimeter behind this is the optic canal. 
I'm putting my stylet here. See, my stylet is showing I'm in the posterior ethmoid. So it's guiding me that I have not reached the end point of the surgery. And I go further down and you see this beautiful optic nerve with the annulus of zinc. This is what you need to see when you do the mm, optic canal decompression. And then as you go further, you keep on decompressing till you see the optic nerve. And once you see the optic nerve, in case, this case, this was an indirect, uh, sorry, this was a direct with a hematoma. So I have used an MVR and I have drained it. So you re when you do something surgery like this, you really need to um, be very precise and you need really a guidance, someone to guide you whether you are in the correct plane. Because a small one millimeter Either other one is there is a chance that you might injure the internal carotid artery and there can be chance of a uh, severe severe bleeding during the procedure. So this is what you see when I was doing the surgery. I was putting my navigation every time I'm putting is going to sphenoid sinus. Then I have realized oh I have not reached the end points. I'm not not in the correct plane. Then I have further modified. I have removed more pieces of bone and I have decompressed further. And then after decompression, when I put the stylus, see now I'm trying to decompress further. I have realized that I was not in the correct plane. And now when I decompress, you will see now when I place the navigation system, it will show now you see this beautiful navigation in the optic canal right from the proximal to the distant and you can see it is moving. So it has shown that I have completed my surgery. I have completed my surgery in the dire correct direction and I have reached the end point of the surgery. And also the many of the time the people question us why you use a navigation C can we do without this and many of my colleagues have tried without the navigation and they had lots of complication. This is because it is a very very vital structure and we also know, need to know before the procedure how long is the optic canal. Sometimes the optic canal is only 6 millimeters. sometimes it is 1.1 millimeter. So exactly you should know the length of the optic canal you should know what are the structures around the optic canal and you see this the ophthalmic artery. Ophthalmic artery is the first branch of the internal carotid artery. So as it comes out, it takes a course from the medial to the lateral. So we do a medial decompression, right? So there's no chance of in injuring the ophthalmic artery. So I feel that and also if you look to the anatomy, the cranial end of the optic canal is much wider and the orbital is much narrower. So all the strangulation of the optic nerve, it occurs more towards the orbital approach. So keeping on hypothesis in all these hypotheses in my mind, I feel that the optic canal decompression through an orbital approach is the most simple, minimally in invasive and a safer procedure if you have something to guide you. And this is how we do, if you see the optic canal, you remove the superior and also you remove the superior medial wall of the optic canal but I usually avoid going the inferior especially inferior lateral because there's every chance of injuring the internal carotid artery. So once you see the moment you punch the medial wall of the optic canal this is the optic canal and you'll see the bigger uh, opening on is a sphenoid sinus that means the lateral wall of the sphenoid sinus forms the medial wall of the optic canal. So once you remove the sphenoid sinus lateral wall that means you have decompressed the optic canal. So these are some of the patients you can see why I am telling you I need a navigation protocol. See this patient has moved different parts of the country and every time everyone has advised a CT scan, CT scan and they were having the 1 millimeter, 1.5 millimeter cut. When he came to me almost after 6 to 8 weeks of the, and total NPL, he had no vision at all. I have asked him to do a navigation protocol and can you see a small bony fragment impinging the optic canal. So here in this case we had done a uh, slice of 0.65. So 0.65 millimeter is so thin that it could pick up this small optic uh, bony fragment. So this is the same patient who had undergone the procedure. I'll skip the surgery and see his VP. This is before the operation. Can you see the curve here? One month after the operation and one year after the operation. So you need to follow this patient not only with the vision, you need to follow the patient with a VEP. You need to follow the patient with the OCT RNFL. This is another case you can see a beautiful hematoma which is causing a direct traumatic optic neuropathy. And here we have also done an MRA and see the VEP changes. Just 12 days you can see at least the VEP wave is coming and his vision has improved. When he came to us it was approximately finger counting around 3 meter or something. But today his vision is 612. 
So, and he came to me after 21 days of the traumatic optic neuropathy. Even if it comes to you after three months and you at least give a try, I have seen patients improving some amount of vision even after three months of the surgery. So, this is under the patient. You can see the bony segment. I am going fast now. These are the changes which you can see the GCL layer. But sometimes you get non-improvement of vision and especially when you have the Delano type of the optic nerve, type 3, type 4. I'll not go into much what is a Delano. I'm sure the residents must be knowing out here. So this type 3 and type 4 Delano optic nerve, the chance is less. Hypoplastic optic canal, the chance of improvement and the lateral fracture. Why lateral fracture? I've already mentioned the internal carotid goes from medial to the lateral so if you have a lateral fracture that means the ophthalmic artery must have been injured the patient already has a compromised blood supply so in a patient having a compromised blood supply there is no point doing a optic canal decompression so i feel the surgical decompression of the optic nerve by an orbital approach has a potential role in the management of traumatic optic neuropathy so there's always a controversy and we are the first in the world to do a transorbital optic canal decompression using the help of the navigation system, which I have reported in our own Indian journal. And sometimes we use the navigation also for the removal of the very deep orbital uh, um, foreign body, especially when we have it somewhere behind the globe. It is so much behind the globe. So you need to design the point of entry and the whole cylinder you need to draw and if you follow the cylinder, you, you will be able to reach wherever is the foreign body number one with very minimal manipulation. Again, you should be careful because the optic nerve is here. So this is how the foreign body has been removed. And this is a sad incident who had a foreign body in the greater wing of the sphenoid. And this foreign body was there for a very long time. You can see I have done a very minimal late crease incision. But as I was going on and I found the foreign body because I was also using my stylet and stylet was giving me the, this is the stylet of the navigation which I was using. And it was also giving me the direction. But uh, when I reached the foreign body, this is with the navigation who was giving me the direction. The, it was totally stuck. So it was so difficult and this is in the greater wing of the sphenoid. So if you just pull it out, there's every possibility you will be injure, injuring the cranial structures behind it. So here I had to take a drill. I had to make some spaces for the foreign body to make it loose. And after drilling the adjacent bone, the foreign body could be removed. So everything which looks simple, but uh, it is very simple when you're in the anterior orbit. But when you enter deep in the orbit, especially in the orbital apex, you must be very careful. And this is the impression. See, it has almost blue. It has become blue, blue. Almost you can see the dura behind it. So these are some of the challenging situation what you need to do. So I'll conclude with this by mentioning that it really guides you and you give helps you to get it right the first time. And before I conclude, I would like to quote Michael Jordan, who has mentioned that something very interesting that there are three kinds of people in this world. One is one who want to want things to happen. Second, who wish things to happen. When we are in the residency stage, when we were fellows, we were residents, we wish that these things should happen. And now we are senior consultants, we should make these things happen. So we, I think we all oculoplastic surgeon, we try our best to make things happen and that too it should happen with precision. So thank you very much for patient hearing. And this is an institute where I work and I have been working in this institute for the last 20 years and heading the department of ophthalmic plastic and reconstructive surgery. So any questions, I'll be the happiest person to reply. 